I first the, when I first read the topic and uh, Louisa invited me, um, I'd previously been asked, been asked in multiple occasions uh, from a planning perspective, from a public space perspective, from mobility. Um, we've been asked, you know, what to do in the new normal, what, what, which new things must we come up with after the pandemic? And I'm very hesitant to, to suggest gimmicks and ideas and policies when uh, we don't actually know what the right question is. And so a lot of our work at our future cities is whether it's on policy or public space or housing, it's, it's actually what's the challenge uh, and you know, are we going to do things the same way and achieve more short-term goals? And those short-term goals could be, okay, this park has slightly more space for everyone um, now that we're sort of obsessed with social distancing, or are we going to start entirely new processes and start to ask the right questions around the very fabric and design and planning of our systems? So I've been very hesitant to say we should do new things we, we should always be building enough quality housing with, with public, private, and public space. We should always be building uh, and planning public transport to be safe and, and high quality and with enough capacity for everyone. Um, we should always be um, uh, allowing enough breathing space in nature to connect with people. So I think the pandemic has just really brought these questions back into light, um, whether it's the quality of our streets, what to use our streets for. So a big part of our work is really just saying what is the actual challenge and is the challenge the pandemic or is the challenge that our cities have been broken for a very long time and we've been forced to use the best of it, uh, the opportunities to cycle, the opportunities to, to get our essential services workers to work and back safely, uh, to get communities talking to each other, to talk to their neighbours, to see how their mental well-being is. And so. Um, a big part of this, I think, is really around understanding uh, what the challenge is. Uh, I have to give some context in South Africa, uh, and in particular Cape Town and, and Johannesburg and Durban, because uh, for many people, they've had uh, years without public space, and not just during the pandemic, but due to apartheid planning for, for many, many decades, um, we've had entirely divided neighborhoods where the quality of life varies quite dramatically between um, if you look at this picture over here, the neighbor on the left, which was the primarily colored area, which is a term used by the apartheid government, which uh, a national freeway was placed between that neighbor on the left um, with the wastewater treatment plant, the neighbor on the right, which was built on the garden city model for the white Caucasian um, population, and then to the south, you'll see a giant power station and that was placed to, to, to separate the sort of black African population. So. Many people for a long time have been divided, and the city has been divided by by race, and and the entire quality of public space and access to that um, has been impacted. And you can see from this this dot um, graphic, which represents 50 people based on their race, um, you know, seven uh, seven eight nine years later, the city remains quite divided due to the economics and social cultural fabric. Um, so. We remain quite a divided city in many ways, and I think the pandemic has has unfortunately reinforced that um, and, and re-raised the questions around who has access to quality public space based on where they live, especially if you're not traveling to work every day. Um, so for many people, home is a very comfortable space and a, and a space where uh, you have access to amenities, but for many people, home could be a, a space they'd want to get away from. If you're in a five by five meter informal settlement, a square meter settlement or house. Um, the space outside is probably primarily where you want to spend your time because it's probably quite dark inside. Uh, and so we've had the, the deep inequalities in, in quality of life being spotlighted again through, through the pandemic. This graphic over here shows in the 60s how entire train station blocks in our city were, were redesigned. Uh, initially, the, the terminal was simply the area in blue. But over 16 city blocks, um, the red and the blue terminals were created for different races. So you would arrive on different trains and enter the city into different, um, uh, through different routes and different pathways uh, based on your race. So movements through and between cities is quite a sensitive issue in South Africa. We also had the, the pass laws. Um, Non-white people weren't allowed downtown after 5 p.m. They had to carry these sort of identity documents or pass documents. 
So South Africa has quite a bit of psychology and trauma and history based in, uh, embedded into that public space fabric. And so when a pandemic hits and you're restricting people by curfews and by times, and, and people are sort of forced to remain in neighbors, which are generally quite dangerous and quite violent, um, it brings up quite a lot of issues, possibly ones that, and questions and answers we can't get to in one presentation. But um, I just had to share the dynamic of what we're dealing with in South Africa, it's not purely um, around do I go to my office or not go to my office. There's a whole bunch of people who rely on public transport and who need to use generally quite poor, a poor service to, to actually access large parts of the city. And so some of the questions are around, and this is a picture of a of a road interchange completed before the 2010 FIFA World Cup, which the regional government is very proud of because, of course, it, uh, the, the two new elevated elements lifted cars over from one side to the other side. And so if you actually visit this by foot every day, you see there are what we call minibus taxi commuters who have to walk through some of these, these um, elevated freeways uh, because everyone's suddenly forgotten that there's a train station below and that people use minibus taxis to get from one side to the other side. And so um, in a project which was probably about uh, 70 million euros uh, 10 years ago, not a single cent was spent in improving the landscape for, for those who are walking from one side to the other side due to job opportunities or moving through because they need to access the train station. Uh, and so if, if we keep doing the same thing based designing the entire city on the on the flow of cars, um, we'll simply end up again with the with the same solutions, which is, you know, you're safe in your car, so you won't get COVID, you won't get uh, disease, uh, and we'll end up with an unhealthy city all over again. And so things like this, which we see cropping up all over the world, and which we've tried to do in Durban, uh, since late May, we've been trying to convince the Durban city government to, to close some roads, to allow restaurants onto the streets and pavements, and un unsuccessfully haven't been able to to put it off yet. And so you can see there's quite a dramatic sort of um, mindset shift which needs to change, um, which is maybe not even based in policy, to go from this sort of really infrastructural modernist thinking to to get an entire civil engineering and transport department simply to put up some bollards and some fences and some tables and some chairs without massive traffic impact studies, which is required in South Africa. And so we go, often go from quite third world to these sort of first world policies of of um, a few tables and chairs and um, and barriers will create you know absolute chaos. Uh, when in fact these are the ways that cities are needing to start to learn um, to start to forge these these new ways. And in some cities, we're looking at things not from a, a street by street perspective, but from a more um, uh, holistic and, and sort of systems perspective to say what are what are all the links required to make a city really walkable and connected for the majority. Uh, and in a city like Durban, uh, the bottom being the waterfront and city center, uh, the top uh, being the World Cup Stadium, the top left of the screen, or the, I suppose the northwest being a, a typical high street, uh, the east being a beautiful five to 10 kilometer promenade. We were asking, you know, what are, what are the missing links in, in building connections? So a public transport commuter could arrive in the central city, but could possibly walk to various parts of the city. And we, we came with this concept of the, the big O or the big ring and and started to really map the quality of these various routes. So when you overlay this onto a map, um, we looked to the south through the city center, which are those links uh, which are really essential. Um, uh, for example, uh, the blue arrow uh, from in the city center uh, right at the bottom from east to west is in some cases, you end up with four to eight traffic lanes in one direction. So it's not so much that there's not enough space for walking, it's just that the entire design has been based on moving cars in one direction. Uh, on the, the eastern edge, you have a beautiful, a really wide beach promenade. But then once you leave that beach promenade, it's really difficult in the north to get from the stadium to, to the high street. And so uh, we should start to look at our cities and our towns not as, as as a number of, of pilots only, we should combine these pilots with sort of the bigger uh, systems thinking around what really connects people on a larger scale. In Cape Town, for example, um, we took away two parking bays about five years ago. Uh, the actual structure, this parklet took two days to install and five months to get through the, the city approvals and the permissions process. 
uh, you know, it's uh, everything from wind studies and, and shading studies to uh, to still having to pay 300 euros a month per parking bay. Luckily, the the property developer who was based there was able to cover that amount for for the nine months. So, uh, but what we achieved was, you know, bringing people uh, a space to sit without having to pay for a coffee. So along this this 1.5 kilometer stretch of road, there's not a single place to just sit down and on a bench and uh, rest while doing grocery shopping or rest without having to pay for a coffee to access Wi-Fi. So there was free Wi-Fi, place for the elderly to um, to stop and have a breather, school kids to use Wi-Fi, it's completely safe. Um, and really this was just a provocation. Uh, you can imagine people who need to sign some papers for health insurance during the day. They can't just leave the office and go to to a coffee shop to, to, to buy a coffee just to to have a space to do some work, um, some bike parking. Um, and in some other spaces in the city center where you have some of the most high quality space, um, great architecture, we, we, we found a few years ago that uh, many people weren't spending time there. Uh, and, and that was simply because um, there wasn't really enough uh, shade and shelter. There wasn't really enough to do. I'm not sure if this video will play, but we did a sort of time lapse of the space and started to see that many people weren't actually remaining inside the space, uh, but were simply moving through. Um, and so it's sometimes not about the space itself, but it's about what's around it. Uh, there were 20 trees, but you know, none of them really provided shade in the correct space. Um, you can see a protest gathering in the bottom right. Nobody actually gathered inside the space. So the question of quality is not so much about uh, the quality of the bricks and the quality of the, the statues and the trees, but it's really about what brings humanity closer together. Uh, and of course, this is where placemaking and, and, and the quality of the space comes together. Um, our recommendation to, to the team that we were working with was to simply start in the first year by bringing people back. So we, we uh, installed the giant um, artificial grass rug to raise awareness around the water crisis, which we experienced in Cape Town. And within a few months, increased the use, users of the space by about 400% with a few art pieces. Um, the mayor was there to open it, although the city government provided zero funding and zero support. But we'll take a mayor cutting a ribbon any day. Um, and so we, we've seen, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that um, it's really easy to spend on big road projects. It's really easy to spend on new bus rapid transit systems. But the moment you try to do tactical, acupunctural type investments in space, it really becomes so difficult for, for city government and for, for collaboration between government, uh, NGOs, and, um, and the private sector who are quite key in, in being a part of this. I think in, in South Africa, there have been so many questions in the pandemic about about the public realm. One of them is, is informal trade. Um, for a long time during our lockdown, uh, you can imagine there are, I think about, as they say, upwards of 30, 35% of our economy is the informal economy and a large part of that is informal trade. And if suddenly if you're banning informal trade everywhere, entire life, livelihoods are being disrupted. And so uh, the safety that traders bring to pavements um, as people are perhaps walking to public transport, the vibrancy they bring, um, if that's suddenly removed, you don't just lose uh, traders, you lose um, entire incomes for, for families. So it's really, really interlinked, um, this public realm concept within, within South Africa. And could you go one step further to, to integrate tech into informal trade, into local businesses? And I know I mentioned earlier, uh, the neighborhood is really important, but our neighbors are comprised of lots of different elements, it's not just uh, corner shops and, and housing, but uh, informal trade, um, you know, the circular economy around goods being recycled and being reused, and and what is the real tech opp opportunity to, to bring these aspects together? We've been thinking about the idea of, um, you know, empty office blocks in our city centers uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, we speak of a housing shortage, but we we have uh, towers and towers of government and, and corporate buildings in sitting empty during large parts of the pandemic. So is the question about a lack of space for, uh, for housing or a lack of property for housing? Or is the question around um, how do we really start to integrate? Um, and, and perhaps going as far as saying, well, you know, what is 
what is the way to cut red tape for, for developers who are going to convert uh, excess office space into, into residential almost overnight? And, and how do you incentivize them? Um, and so again, a big question is just, do we keep investing in, in a particular project with the goal of, of, of just fixing that space or could we develop neighborhood identity in the process? In some neighborhoods we work in, which is primarily migrants from across Africa, it's not simply about paving a pathway and providing some trees, but how do you develop neighborhood identity, put in investments in one project, improve safety, improve incomes for, for traders, um, make the city healthier and more inclusive, and benefit various cultural groups. So the way we approach space is not from a design or a one-dimensional perspective, but you know, how do you really get your, your, your value for investment and get multiple benefits embedded into a project from the start? And of course, it really depends on the context you're looking, in, uh, looking into. Um, in many of our, what we call densest neighbors, they have an almost unsustainable level of density, which affects the access to services, electricity, um, the ambulance services can't respond in an emergency. The police services struggle to respond in, in various crises. So um, when we're all in lockdown, um, how do you start to serve the, the densest parts of the city um, in, more, in more interesting ways? How do you start to deal with the questions of waste um, and transforming these, these, um, uh, these areas into, into better playgrounds and better spaces for, for people out there? And then again, where are the spaces? Um, a great organization called People's Environmental Planning uh, has started to map the various ways in which people are, are, are having access to space. And one of them, for example, is, is the difficulty in, in, in local communities accessing land for food gardening. So the government has really tedious processes to take a lease or rent on public land. And so there could be space, but you could imagine that somebody who's perhaps not the most knowledgeable about, about this process uh, wouldn't know the process to to get a lease in, in terms of food gardening, where the gathering spaces, um, and, and where is the sort of acupunctural point we need to make you know, the most impact in, in really dense neighborhoods. And, and, and at night, um, uh, what do you do about safety? Um, there's been a lot of, of uh, outcry and, and advocacy work about these high mast, almost prison-like street lighting. Um, and so, uh, what does lockdown mean for the for the majority of our country who are constantly facing um, a lack of services and resources and a lack of public space and in many cases are too afraid to use them uh, in the evening because of our safety issues public transport um, you know how do we provide enough capacity for everyone uh, you could imagine that in a, in a lockdown situation uh, in level five in South Africa when only essential services workers could travel they're probably traveling in quite, uh, with very few commuters traveling in quite dark situations, um, large spaces with very few commuters. So there, there are a number of impacts um, when we're not producing quality, safe, vibrant and inclusive public spaces. And, um, and what many might see as a crowd could be safety numbers um, compared to, to various levels of lockdown. And so uh, one of our approaches, which is a new project, well, not a new project, but a, a project which we work with in a, in a neighborhood called Muchestain was simply just to, to start to do things, not to overstudy, to overanalyze. We've been working with artists. We've been working with, um, with uh, local groups to provide a community kitchen. We've been working with a graffiti artist to paint some walls. And so our approach there was just to start doing, to start building some, some neighborhood pride, not to start from a master plan perspective and then get into a placemaking strategy and then get into a, a, a tactical approach. And um, this month, through a very small grant, I think of about 300, maybe 3,000 euros, we'll be taking the project to the next phase, which is some seating areas for children, um, uh, some additional landscaping in some areas, uh, which are quite harsh. Uh, and then really just to end a key lesson from from I suppose a year or so of that public space is just the strength of community networks. Um, really giving a platform to local knowledge. Um, we've seen community kitchens, soup kitchens. Uh, we've seen safety networks grow simply from platforms like WhatsApp. Um, and so uh, it's really that, that government and business collaboration with a network um, across the city, which has been the biggest strength. And that's really where your resilience comes from when you can't access public space or when, uh, when you're restricted from your, your daily movements.
Thank you very much.